The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Are you tired of being misguided by self-serving financial service profit seekers? Are you looking for a better way to take control of your destiny and create a financially free path for future generations? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Banking on Your Retirement Podcast. We cut through the noise of the often self-serving financial markets with simplified yet foundational financial principles for creating a more peaceful, joyful, and prosperous life. So be brave and be free. This is your home. Now, here's your Banking on Your Retirement host, Johnny Ward. Hey, welcome back, everyone. Uh, Johnny Ward here. Uh, I've going to try to piece together a story today. Um, and that story really is the marriage between government and the banking system. Uh, I'm going to touch upon a bunch of uh, little clips um, that I've included today. And I'm going to start with uh, picking up a little bit from last week with Peak Prosperity, Chris Martinson. And his guest this week is an author of a book called Naked, Short, and Greedy, Wall Street's Failure to Deliver. Her name is Dr. Susan Trimbath. And, you know, it's interesting, right? Naked, uh, short. Um, of course, naked means there's nothing really there. There's no coverage. <laughs> and sh short, right, is shorting the market, selling the market like they did in the movie called Big Short. Um, and, you know, again, even Hollywood uh, glamorizes uh, these stories, and that becomes the only story, right? So in, as far as I'm concerned, they whitewash it, um, even though it looks like, hey, we're, we're showing the truth of what happened. I think you'll find that, um, you know, people that really do uh, journalism dig deep, um, they find the, the real truth, the full truth, and I think you'll be quite amazed it, what Dr. Susan Trimbath has to say with Chris today. And we're going to run a couple of clips and then I'll make some comments. And uh, so we'll start with the first one right now. Lehman Brothers in particular was pointed out by an article in the Village Voice called Wall Street Walker um, for, mm. uh, for selling mortgage-backed securities for which they had no mortgages, especially in Florida. And they took like well, teachers... Say that again. <laughs> What? Yeah. Say that again more slowly. <laughs> selling, <laughs> selling MBS mortgage-backed securities for which there were no mortgages. With no M, it was just BS. Instead of being an MBS, <laughs> it was just a BS because there was no M. Yeah, so we do need some humor with this, right? Uh, mortgage-backed securities are a bundle of mortgages. They're packaged together. They're sold as a bond, and what she's saying is through the courts uh, and people going to uh, bankruptcy court, uh, they um, found that there was sometimes no mortgage attached to the security. And so, you know, there's such a um, pressure or uh, greed that goes on in this financial world that they, they've got to keep this merry-go-round going. They, they want the the money train to continue and eventually it does burst and collapse and then they start all over again um and they say hey we are coming to bail everybody out we're coming out to bail out the american people to bail out the banks and the truth is they're bailing themselves out and so we're going to run this next clip and uh yeah listen in it was estimated that at one point by a bankruptcy judge that probably a third of the mortgage-backed securities in circulation in 2008 didn't have mortgages. The scale of that is astonishing to me. That must have been a trillion or more dollars of stuff. Trillions, around. plural, yeah. Trillions. Plural. Yeah, plural. The scale of that, that's so audacious. Yeah. I mean... Yeah. I mean, if, if I try and sell a used car that I don't have title to, I get in trouble, right? Right, right. Yeah. So how do we know that they were selling uh, just the BS with, with, no, with no mortgage attached? No mortgages. Well, for example, um, the bondholder, the trustee for the bonds, would uh, 
try to take the homeowner <clears throat> to court <clears throat> in order to, uh, you know, exercise a lien against the property for the mortgage, right? In Florida, Ohio, California, and I think Nevada, um, the in the bankruptcy court, the house was awarded to the homeowner because the bondholder, the bond trustee, could not prove a lien against the property. In other words, there was no mortgage for which that house was listed as the underlying asset. The homeowner walked away with the house, and the bonds were told, see you later. And you think about the massive uh, devastation that occurred throughout 2000, let's just say 2008 to 2010, uh, where people lost their jobs, lost their homes, um, destroyed their credit. Um, and really, it was due to this level of greed. Don't fool yourself that this is not still happening. In fact, it's happening, and it's happening in a much, much bigger way. And I think that's a part of what I'm trying to explain. It's not me just being a naysayer about the stock market and that you have your ups and downs and, and you know, even things like Bitcoin. You know, hey, I know people make money. They do, obviously. But what happens is the music stops and there's many people that don't find a chair. And that is criminal. And that's what we're after. So we're going to run one more clip from Susan and, uh, and Chris. It feels to me, and this is just one man's opinion, um, that, that, you know, we had this little, like we had this 1987 hiccup, you know, and, and so Greenspan wrote in with a put. And then 1994-5, we had a corporate bond hiccup, and they did the sweep accounts thing where they eliminated reserve requirements effectively. And then we had long-term capital management. Oh, that required a slightly bigger intervention. Then we had 2001, 2000, 2001. Oh, that required an even bigger intervention. Then we had the great housing crisis, an even bigger intervention. I'm, my lifetime is just bigger and bigger and bigger. I feel like I'm in a car that's mm -hmm. oversteering both directions, you know. <laughs> and, and I'm wondering what you think. What's the next act in that particular drama I've just laid out? Yeah, I don't, I don't, see, I don't see this turning out well. <laughs> I really don't. Um, you know, it's, we're all sort of stuck with it at some point, because if you have any sort of retirement pension that's not self-directed, you know, you're kind of in there. Like you, can, you know, you're, you're kind of in the mix, and you're relying on the government to bail them out uh, at some point. Um, but it is not sustainable. It is an unsustainable process. So I'll break that down a little bit, at least my commentary, which is Chris saying, uh, you know, all these crises that, have, crises that have happened throughout his lifetime, which he's roughly my age, and I observed them also. Uh, I, I've been a student of this and watched the corruption uh, and the kicking of the can down the road that we are continually putting ourselves in jeopardy and it's all to chase the buck. But remember, you're the lender. You're lending all your money. You lend it to the banks when you put your deposits in. You lend your money when you put it into the market. What are you lending to? And who are you lending to? This is what you're lending to. You're lending to this corruption, right? The one thing I, you know, I'm not picking on Susan because I think she's doing a great job throughout this interview, which you can find in the show notes, is her saying, you're kind of stuck in there. Well, that's why I'm such a promoter of the Liberty Dollar, because it's an alternative. And we don't have to be in this world. We choose to be in this world. Think about it. Think it through. That's really what I'm trying to get across here. So, I'm going to move on to something called the Chris Hedges Report. Now, Chris has done some incredible investigative reporting, and he's interviewing today, a, in this clip that we're going to run, a couple of clips, Gretchen Morganson. She's the author of These Are the Plunderers, How Private Equity Runs and Wrecks America. 
She's going to go on and talk a little bit about how these people and private equity are really the same people that we used to refer to back in the 80s with Michael Milken, corporate raiders, hostile takeovers, leveraged buyouts. These were all negative terms, right? And that's what they do is they change the names. They change the names of airlines that get in trouble. They change the names of, hey, uh, you know, hey, this is a bad coined phrase for us. So we're going to call it private equity. That just sounds, hey, that's not government. That's private. Well, they're very tied in um, with the legal system and with the government. And there's no separation between these people. So I'm going to have us run this first clip and let uh, Gretchen talk a little bit. These are the plunderers, how private equity runs and wrecks America. Let's begin with what they are. They've just rebranded themselves, uh, but I'll let you start. Well, Chris, these are the old um, takeover titans that we started to learn about in the 80s. R.J. Nabisco was the big deal that focused everyone's attention on them. And they just rebranded themselves, as you said, into something called private equity. A little bit more genteel, sounds like it actually might be fair, equity being that word. Um, so these are just those corporate raiders that really were sort of fearsome. And, uh, you know, Congress at that time was concerned about what they were going to do to the economy. Congress lost interest and went on to the next thing. And, of course, they did then go on to, over the next few decades, really um, pillage the economy and workers. And yeah, and that's really what's going on. So when you feel sometimes like, isn't there a better way? You know, what's really happening? Why, why is it we... You know, we might get ahead, but so to speak, get ahead. But that we think, well, shouldn't we be doing better? Uh, shouldn't we still have some money left over? Um, yeah, and they've also helped us drive to seek this American dream, which has reaped uh, uh, wreaked havoc with relationships, marriages, so forth and so on, because people are chasing sometimes things that aren't their dreams. They're the dreams of the imagery that they've get given us, whether it commercials, advertisements, so forth and so on. And everybody's got to be a movie star, right? Everybody's got to live the glamorous life because that's a sign of success amongst your peers and, and it's supposed to make you feel better. But in the end, you know, things fall apart regardless, regardless of whether there's all these things in this money. So we're going to let... Um, uh, Chris and uh, Gretchen talk a few more minutes and then I'll uh, come back and make some comments and then we'll go to break and then I'm going to wrap things up about what's going on right now, right this week uh, about private equity. really not about operating the company, as you say. It's really about stripping the assets, uh, extracting the money that they can from it. It's an extraction business. So they buy a company, they then find out how they can make it more efficient, um, which means usually firing many people, um, stripping the assets. So I'm going to just stop it there so that we can talk about what she just said, which is stripping assets. So they look for companies, these private equity firms, that they can go in and they can say, hey, they have land, you know, maybe we can sell off some of the land, maybe we can sell off some of the buildings. And they put very little of their money into these private equity funds, right? They're about raising money, you know? They're like venture capitals, capitalists that way. They go to these public pension funds like uh, teachers unions and, and their retirement funds, and they talk to the custodians of those funds and say, Hey, this is our plan. We're going to go and buy a bunch of companies. We're going to make them you know, more efficient operationally. But as she stated, this is an extraction business. This is not about efficiency. This is about them making money, right? And it doesn't matter how they do it. They don't care if they you know, leave the, the community in devastation, uh, not only just the sense of community, 
but the actual individuals within the community. Because many of these communities, there is corporations that, you know, um, employ many. And what they do is they end up weakening these things into the point where they have to close their doors. They could have been very successful for 50, 100 years. It doesn't matter. And that's what private equity is about. There's some big concerns, even in the insurance business, and I could get into that if people want to reach out to me. Uh, and I can tell you that I work with a life insurance company that does not take any private equity money. And that is going to be a disaster. So what I want to do is we're going to let Liberty Dollar talk with us for a moment. When I come back, I'm going to tie this together with a story about a bank that has just been infused with some capital from private equity and who these people are behind it. Have you heard about Liberty Dollar Financial Association? Liberty Dollar is a private membership association that allows its members to purchase silver in different forms, which are lawful for use as mediums of exchange. Liberty Dollar Financial Association is a private alternative currency that is provided to members in both digital and paper warehouse receipts. They also sell physical Liberty coins for your personal possession, or they'll securely store your precious metals for you. They provide members with various services that allow them to use their silver's value as a means of exchange, such as their bill pay service, where they will pay your bills out of your silver account, similar to your current banker. Additionally, they offer a term deposit investment account where currently they are paying out in silver a guaranteed 1% per month, which can be compounded over a one-year term. Liberty Dollar just celebrated 25 years as a silver bullion dealer, storage facility, and exchange. To learn more about Liberty Dollar Financial Association or to become a free member, visit ldrep.nl forward slash B-O-Y-R. That's Liberty Dollar Financial Association. So you might ask yourself, right? (laughs) Welcome back. Uh, You know, what does this have to do with retirement, right? This has to do with me saying it's an ability for you to use life insurance to help you uh, not only throughout your lifetime with financing, but to have that cash still available for your retirement cash flow. But I also use the play on words that you're banking on it, you're counting on it, and What I'm trying to expose here um, with the help of others is, you know, how tenuous all of this is, that we don't know that it's rock solid. In fact, it isn't. There's there's so much we're going to go into in further episodes. But I want to move on to this article. And I want to talk briefly about the the actual title. because as you can state, well, I can't really even, <laughs> I, I'll just say that it, it states the NYCB profits from sig- Signature Bank acquisition lost, right? So if what we most of us are, and many times I just see the headline and you read it quick and, well, I want to tell you. NYCB stands for New York Community Bank. They bought the assets of Signature Bank last year, or a portion thereof. And in March of uh, 2023, we had Silicon Valley Bank, and we had Signature Bank, and we had uh, at least one or two more uh, regional banks uh, fail. And So this bank in New York, Community Bank, uh, bought these uh, assets, and now I'm going to show you that they're they're really falling apart themselves. And but when you look at the title, right, you see NYCB profits from Signature. But if you really read it, what it should state is NYCB loses profits from their signature bank acquisition. That would be much more clear. But if you read the very beginning of that, it sounds like they profited. <laughs> so well, like, what's going on? Nothing wrong there. Well, they've, uh, you know, just as recently as January 31st, they lost 38% all in one day of their share price. Uh, and what I want to continue to show is 
how these things fall apart. We're going to run a clip here. Sorry to get all my notes straight. Um, from Lynette Zhang. She is going to show you a little bit about who is going to bail out New York Community Bank, NYCB. So if we could run that clip, that would be great. Union of the duo with a track record of stirring up controversy as they chase returns. Before their posts in Trump's administration, Mnuchin led an investor group that bought fall, failed mortgage lender Indy Mac. And you guys, some of you might remember that. It wasn't that long ago, really. After the 2008 financial crisis and rebranding it, One West installed Odding as CEO. So they're they're running this the same playbook right now. By the time they cashed out at more than double their purchase price, the lender was beset with accusations it had hurt communities as a foreclosure machine. Okay, so. You know, again, we're going to have sources in the in the show notes that you can refer to that you can watch her whole um, video. Sorry about that. And I want to say that she's referring to Stephen Mnuchin. He was the Secretary of the Treasury under Trump, and he, along with a longtime partner named Joseph Otting, O T T I N G, they are they're part of a private equity firm that has packaged all these resources together and they've infused a billion dollars into NYCB. Again, private equity, right? <laughs> I'm making a point here. And the fact is, is that she also mentions that they had uh, teamed, Min Mnuchin and Odding had teamed in the past. So, Back in uh, probably 2008, 2009, I'm not sure of the year, um, but we had what you call subprime lenders who were part of this collapse in the mortgage-backed securities. And one of the largest ones on record, at least up to that time, was a, a company called IndyMac Bank, which is really quite strange to me because I actually interviewed with the president of IndyMac Bank in, uh, I think, around May or June of, um, of <laughs> it's funny, right, of 1999. And they offered me a job, but I didn't take it because they wanted to pay me a lower salary. I probably could have done very well. Maybe I've got myself into the mix of, of bad stuff. I don't know. But... Um, they, they would go to what you call subprime, which is, is outside the conventional uh, requirements for loans, right? It might be no-doc loans where you don't have to tell them, you know, where your income's coming from. You don't have a job. You know, they raise the uh, ratios much higher, right? Again, because of this greed, they want to keep this gravy train going, and they don't want to, you know, um, play by the rules. They want to you know, shortcut the rules by changing them in the middle of the game. And eventually, who's left holding the bag, right? Or without a chair when the music stops. And they always point it at us, right? And I want to say that they also whitewashed, and I'm going to show you this uh, Joseph Odding, right? He is going to be the the new CEO of New York Community Bank. Now, it states in this uh, beginning of this story that he was um, the president and, and member of the board of directors of One West Bank, which was the new name for IndyMac, right? So when people get their name tarnished, wouldn't it be great if we all just went out, you know, we maybe some things we're embarrassed about. So we decided we're going to change our name so nobody even can relate back to who we were tied to. But she stated that they doubled their profits. Again, it was extraction. These banks don't even exist, right? So they, they basically get rid of them. They, they take everything they possibly can, get all their profits, and out they go, right? That's what they are. They're extractors. Now, this isn't a political show, but I do want to state for the record that I do not believe either 
the Democrats or the Republicans are on our side. There's all kinds of history written about this. They are on the same team. Do me a favor. Do some research on the Council for Foreign Relations and see who's actually running this world. That's where they are. They're in New York at the Council of Foreign Relations. These people are also all buddies. They all went to different, you know, these these good schools, and I'm not knocking good schools or good names, you know, that have a good brand, so to speak. But they're they're in and out of each other's business. Mnuchin, you know, he's the Secretary of the Treasury for Trump. This gentleman, Joseph Odding, was the comptroller of the currency, which is basically the accountant for the U.S. government, right? And he also was in charge of the Federal Housing and Finance Authority uh, during that same time, right? So this, you know, these people aren't pure just because, hey, they're on one side of the aisle or the other. And somehow these guys are now tied to this New York Community Bank and they're in the private equity business, right? And they're going to come in. Do you think that they're coming in to save New York Community Bank? Or do you think they're going to do the same thing, that they're going to strip out all the assets and they're going to leave potential people maybe that don't get bailed out by the FDIC? And if they do, if they have over the $250,000 limit, maybe they're not going to get anything else covered, right? Because, you know, Janet Yellen said she's going to pick winners and losers uh, in meetings with the FDIC. So... This is the kind of thing that I think we all need to be aware of and know that um, we're exposed. We, we're the ones that are naked and that we basically have no coverage, right? Because it's at the whim of these people that are running the show. Now, is there a way to escape? Yes. There is a way, and please pay it. Pay attention to the show. Please subscribe. Please share this. Like it. All that kind of stuff. And also set up the notification so you'll know when the next show is coming out. And it's not all, you know, this isn't my life about being serious all the time. I like to have fun too. But I think that people need to stop and think. I know. We'd rather have some fun because we work so hard. We run around. But we're having so much stripped from us while we're trying to produce. And that's the goal, is to find out how do I keep more of what I'm working so hard for. So thanks for listening. Hope you have a great week, and we'll talk next week. Johnny Ward, banking on your retirement. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Banking on Your Retirement podcast. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and YouTube at Banking on Your Retirement. And don't forget to rate and review us on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again for listening. The information expressed on this podcast is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. Personal due diligence is the listener or viewer's sole responsibility. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.